Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event. My name is Alice Waitman. I'm the CEO of Hanson Search. We're a headhunting business uh, globally specialising in the PR and communications sector. And I'm really delighted today um, to be joined by our, our panel, all female panel, um, to explore a really important topic in the industry, which is about representation, recruitment and retention of black ethnic black ethnic minorities in the UK um, in PR and communications. There was a recent survey conducted by the CIPR and um, this was called the State of the Profession Report. And it found the lack of representation is a serious issue in PR and communications industry within the UK. 91% of respondents identified as being white. And I found this particularly disappointing with all the great initiatives that have happened in my career of 20 years headhunting in this industry. You know, there has really been a rise in um, initiatives and businesses and organisations committed to making a change. So to hear these results was really very disappointing. And I think as a headhunting business, as recruiters in this sector, we really are committed to making a change and understand the important role that we play. But also this is about businesses and employees. And so, you know, exploring important topics around recruitment, around retention, about bias and prejudice in the recruitment process, but also about meaningful engagement and how that leads to better retention and inclusive workforces, which are important for businesses. So we're going to be sharing top tips, um, and advice and tools for both employees and employers, which is really important. And I'm delighted to be joined um, by initially Cam Pierce, who is the founder of a communications agency called Calder, as well as the founder of the UK Black Communications Network, who are on a mission to increase the seniority of Black PR and communication professionals in the UK. Joanne Robinson, who is the CEO of Ketchum. It's a global leading communications industry, uh, agency and she's been doing a lot in the industry around diversity. And Charlene Brown, who is the CEO and co-founder of Hewlett Brown, a people's intelligence business specializing in culture, diversity and inclusion in the workforce. So, Cam, I'd love to start with you, actually. I know you've done some um, recent reports and surveys. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about your findings and also, you know, what your organisation is doing to make a change. Thanks, Alice, and great to be a part of this panel and to meet everyone. Um, so, um, as you said, last year, um, I founded the Black Comms Network. We have a, a really um, small team, but we've been up to... Um, up to lots. I think the key thing to say is that, you know, one of the first kind of things that we did um, before actually opening the membership and um, kind of, I guess, servicing our kind of community of black comms professionals um, was to conduct some research. And for us, it was about really quantifying the problem. There was a lot of anecdotal kind of, um, you know, we had the CIPR report and various other reports. But as a black comms professional, there's a lot of anecdotal kind of evidence, I guess, in terms of the experiences people were, were facing around pay and promotion, around recognition and around lived experience um, as a black PR professional. So um, we worked with um, Opinion and we conducted um, a survey of black comms professionals, about 200, uh, just under 230 black comms professionals completed the survey. And some of the key things we found more broadly was that uh, it's a 70-30 split. So black comms prof professionals choose in-house over agency. And agency is, you know, is not seen as a great experience for black comms professionals. Um, that 39% have more than a decade of experience, but the majority are stuck in the middle. So it doesn't compare when you look at kind of the seniority of black comms professionals. Um, they're either kind of mid-management level and below. And um, 208 of the respondents have been in comms for more than a year. So um, out of all of the respondents, we focus the, the data that I'll talk you through will be around those people who are actually in, um, in a role. And the kind of key stat that we led with when we had our launch was around the lack of promotion. So just 48% had had an internal promotion. 
um, and many had to move. And, you know, this does happen in our, you know, in our industry anyway. But I think it was quite startling to read that most people have to move or are leaving the industry because of this fact. Um, and I think that, you know, what was also interesting to understand was more than two thirds had received um, kind of verbal praise um, or been told that they were doing really well, but this hadn't resulted in a promotion or a pay rise or a bonus or anything, you know, which are the key things which are gateways to kind of that promotion and those senior level roles. So there's a real issue around recognition bias um, and around um, trust. Um, when, when we read through the, the, the verbatims from the survey, there was a real issue around industry sort of, um, or leaders trusting black comms professionals in senior in those senior roles where perhaps another member of staff wasn't there. So having that gravitas or seeing like, the, you know, having that perception that they can hold a room, can advise a client was a, you know, is a real issue. And so a lot of the quotes um, and kind of, like I said, the verbatim that we received and one in particular really stands out was that there is a perception that black talent is not capable of operating at a senior level and will not be seen as credible by senior internal stakeholders or clients. And that was repeated in lots of different ways, but with similar themes throughout the research. On the flip side of that, the other piece around kind of the experience of actually working, um, you know, in, in the industry, the key kind of pieces were around discrimination and were around microaggression. So although when, when there were senior black talent, um, you know, in the room with a client, for example, they were often seen as junior, the most junior person in the room. Um, we had 19% who said they've been mistaken for a cleaner or toilet tenant. So lots of the stats that you might have seen in other industries or been reported are going on in our industry. And even when they were in, uh, were or are in senior roles, the, you know, clients or other stakeholders would direct, you know, those kind of strategic counsel um, questions uh, to some to one of their colleagues, not expecting them to be the most senior person. So that just really shows you that. I guess the magnitude of the challenge here in terms of there's a piece around actually recognizing black talent and black talent being stuck in the middle and then being almost demotivated but then actually in terms of attitudes um there's there's a, there's a massive problem here in terms of having senior people and i think you know people always ask which i know will come on to you know what is the industry doing or has the, have things changed and i think there has been quite a lot of a focus on recruitment and appointments but actually the shift in senior talent or even talent that's in the middle you know that have that five to ten years or, or more experience rising to senior levels you know we're going to be um, benchmarking our survey again but from what we know anecdotally from members that hasn't changed um thank you for sharing that and some quite shocking um findings there um Joanne, I'd love to come on to you next, actually, because Ketchum has been recognised by both PR Week and the DRAM for the diversity work that you've um, been doing. In fact, you've recently won a, an award on diversity and inclusion. Um, can you share your journey of what's happening in Ketchum and some of the best practices and, and how that's making a difference and what representation looks like for you as a business within Ketchum? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think the sad thing is, is that none of the stats that Cam shared are surprising to me at all. Um, and I think there's been a lot of talk in our industry about change, but not much evidence of it actually happening. And when I was appointed CEO of Ketchum the end of 2017, one of the things that was critical for me was actually changing that talk into action because I've been turning up at you know the PRCA census for God longer than it, uh, I'd like to say and it's the same stats every year and we say it's important every year but it never ever changes and that's been incredibly frustrating for me so the first thing that I'd say is well, it has to be led from the top you have to show the commitment from the most senior person and most senior team and so when I wrote my five-year plan for Ketchum in the UK, one of my three, I just had three business priorities, and one of them was driving change in diversity and inclusion. And I'll be really honest in this call, I got a lot of pushback on that, that diversity and inclusion wasn't a business uh, priority, a business strategy, it was an initiative. Uh, and I just, yeah, those of you who know me on the call know that I'm quite a stubborn Glaswegian. Uh, and so I just held firm that I, I totally didn't believe that. I believe that if we could transform 
the diversity of our workforce at the same time as building an inclusive culture that fundamentally that be transformational for our business and we would see that in the financial results so it started with that commitment and that determination and then lots of people ask me oh how have you done it well it's been yeah we're going into our fourth year now it hasn't been fast and it hasn't been easy we've had to spend a lot of time a lot of money uh, and a lot of commitment so the first thing is we did a root and branch review of our organization and that was everything from our processes our policies our systems and our attitudes so the kind of hard things as well as the soft things and we did it with a partner so we did it with a partner called creative equals who came in and really did a full audit of our entire organization and there was two sides to that one was really heartwarming made me really proud because our anonymous staff survey was so positive about where we were starting from in terms of our inclusive culture. Uh, but actually the audit of our policies, processes, systems was really poor. So we knew, we knew really quickly what our roadmap had to be to change and the commitments that we had to make. And there's probably four things I'd say from that starting point in the journey. The first was we set ourselves targets. And I know there's lots of discussion about targets and my simple response to people who say they're not going to set targets uh, in terms of the diversity of their workforce. Well, you set targets in terms of your commercials, you set targets in other people metrics in terms of turnover and engagement. If you're not setting targets, it's because you're not taking it seriously. So we set ourselves some hard targets. We also really looked at where there was low hanging fruit. Uh, and to be honest, one of the biggest areas was in recruitment. So how could we completely change our recruitment uh, process and policies to be more inclusive and actually just to be more prescriptive to the partners? So one of the things that we now insist upon is we won't start interviewing people until we have a diverse uh, shortlist. It's really simple, does make our partners jobs and our in-house recruiters jobs a bit harder. But, you know, if you want to make progress, that's important. The other was we built it into everybody's objectives. So whilst, you know, all of my leadership team, of course, have commercial objectives, they have client objectives, they also have diversity uh, objectives, and they are um, success. Uh, you know, part of it is about how are they diversifying their teams, but it's also about how inclusive is their culture. And I think that's critical. We worked on both at the same time. So we really tried to attract people in, but we knew that they would just leave again if we hadn't really worked on the inclusiveness of our culture the other things i'd say is listen like even today you know i know we're held up as being industry leaders and i think if someone had told me you, know, you asked about where we are in our journey if someone had told me three years ago that at this point we would have 25 percent of our workforce is now non-white uh, and to cam's point actually 30 percent of our senior leadership team is non-white so we've really you know we're kind of ahead of ourselves in the senior team and if you go to the next layer down that middle layer it's 25 percent too so we haven't just focused on bringing entry-level uh diverse candidates and we've again root to branch we've focused on it and we haven't always got it right you know whilst i'm really proud of the progress we've made you know I kind of now that we've made that progress, I'm a bit disappointed that it's only 25%, it's only 30%. And the idea is that there's not enough diverse talent out there is utter nonsense. So if anyone tries to use that excuse, hold a mirror up to yourself, you can find incredibly talented, ambitious people who have got an amazing track record. They're not, probably not looking at your organization. They're not coming to be recruited to your organization because what they see from the outside isn't attractive. So you know, there's plenty of talent out there for the organizations who are being incredibly progressive. And then the last thing that I'd say, and this is something that I've really noticed over the last 12 months, like the responsibility to build an inclusive culture and to really move the metrics and how diverse your workforce is, is everyone's responsibility. And I think far too often I see organizations and leaders turn to the black Asian or ethnic minorities in their business to lead and drive the change and to be honest I think that's utter bullshit like the change has to come from you as an individual as a leader it has to be demanded from your leadership team and then it has to be embedded throughout the organization you know our 
black, Asian and ethnic minority colleagues have got enough to deal with without expecting them to drive the change in the organisation. Of course, it's important to listen uh, to those voices and to prioritise those voices as you make some changes, but expecting them to be the ones who drive it is, is not good. Thank you, Joanne, for sharing that. Um, some great insights there. Um, Charlene, I'd like to come to you next. I mean, you've heard from Cam and Joanne, who are both communication professionals and, and work in the industry. Obviously, you work across many different industries, um, but you're hearing, you know, it's mainly a white profession um, within PR. Um, while it seems there are recruitment initiatives going on, still there needs to be fundamental change. What should organisations be doing from your experience um, in terms of helping other businesses to recruit and retain people of colour? Yeah, thank you. And I agree with everything that um, Cam and Joanne uh, shared. One of the things that Joanne shared about the review that um, you'd undertaken at Ketchum, I think is probably the principal base of what organisations should look to do in terms of their recruitment as well. There's behaviours there that can, trans can translate into recruitment. It's certainly something that we do at Howlett Brown, helping organizations really unearth and understand their people, the intelligence aspect, but what's happening structurally, procedurally, and how they're experiencing that. And the same can be said when it comes to recruitment. I think um, there is no point fixing or changing your recruitment processes if your um, behaviors or attitudes aren't ready for change. Um, but I look at it on a three pronged approach, the structural, procedural and the experiential. So, and you can't do one without the other. You can't change process and procedure without making sure the structure of the operation is, an, is optimal to be able to help that, that change. You can't really change hearts and minds, behaviors or experiences of people in your workplace if you're not looking at from a backdrop um, what those procedures and what that structure looks like too. And within that, there's a whole raft of accountability as well as what Joanne was saying. When it comes to recruitment specifically as well, I think there's a number of things that can happen. You need to look at um, your entire process um, clinically and transparently from end to end. Everything from how do we even draft advertisements in our job descriptions um, what language do we use? Does that language translate to what our values are? I've worked with many clients who think they are inclusive and want to invite people, but then use language and descriptions that just don't really resonate. So it's looking at it in its simplest form from that. Then it's where, where do you promote? How do you engage people? If you're just going to the standard places or you're not thinking about how you visually represent yourself, then that's also something that can be reflected. Then it's about the process. How do you attract and bring people into the process? Where can you remove bias? We do a lot of review on policy, but also practice removing anti-bias, but promoting workplace inclusion and best practice from law. I'm an employment lawyer as well as a DEI expert by background. Um, and so we look at those things as well. So that's something that employers can do for a start and then start to shift that practice. And then it's around the decision making about who gets the job and why. I think the, the traditional kind of assumptions around what talent is and how talent should be cultivated and who gets a chance. In a lot of organizations, they're old, they're archaic and they need to be refreshed. If those attitude, attitudes had been applied to me, who was, um, you know, I'm originally from the North, I came to London, this kind of keen, um, um, kind of punchy uh, want, wannabe lawyer at, at the time that I joined, if, if I didn't push, push hard and try and convince people, I wouldn't even got my foot in the door and I wouldn't be here where I am today. So I think what we define as talent shouldn't be automatically aligned to traditional constructs of that. Look at what gives you a diff, you know, what, what adds value to your organization in the current climate and way of going as an organization too, I think is incredibly important. And then it's about um, bringing them in and making sure that there are structures that allow for equity, not equality, equity, ensuring real, real um, fairness and people are appropriately positioned to where they should be. Um, and that doesn't always happen. And this is what I mean, if you haven't taken a hard look in your organization, then actually all that work will just fall away because it comes into an environment that actually has problems already. And that needs to be done 
too. And probably one of the last things I would say is I'm a great believer in um, training and education, but that follows through to action. All of our training is based on knowledge, empathy, action and review. I don't think you can you can talk the talk and you can build all this knowledge and um, and kind of uh, language and terminology for an organization and your staff. But actually, if you can't translate that into an action. So, if, Cam, you were talking about microaggressions. If. if if all of your staff know about what the definition of microaggressions are, but don't know how to actively diffuse them or deal with them when they occur, then nothing changes on the retention side of your recruitment process. And finally, the last thing I would probably say about what you can do is your service providers around who is recruiting, whether that's internal people or external sources, um, headhunters, recruitment organizations helping you, you need to make sure they're equipped. DNI, equity, DEI, however you want to pronounce it from an acronym standpoint, was not a fundamental part of anyone's education unless it was delivered to you at home or you chose to do it as a career. So people may think they know, they don't really know from a technical standpoint on the things they should be doing and that needs to be changed. And if your service providers don't want to do that, you're, you're, a, you're a client. I think you should be mandating that and making sure that people are demonstrating that they really get what it means to recruit in an inclusive way and that there this kind of talk follows through to action we I, I'm, I'm with Joanne I don't do I don't do anything unless it converts to action it's a huge bugbearer of mine from training from advisory work that we do right through to the strategy it has to translate so yeah so just looking at their interim process clinically and quite transparently and making sure that you already have an environment that can bring that change in and it can be supported and it will change and you will see a, a, um, a real um, sea change in who, who comes through the door and who stays more importantly as well. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, I want to deep dive first of all into the recruitment side. Um, I was, Cam, I was quite shocked when you said about the divide of, of the survey that you did. 70% of people surveyed were in-house and only 30% agency. Um, so, Joanne, I'm, I'm going to come and ask you a bit more about this. But, Cam, why do you think that's the case? Uh, so, anecdotally, you know, we speak to members all the time. I was speaking to a member um, a, couple of, a couple of days ago, actually, around a kind of senior role because we have a jobs board. And... Um, the feeling, the sentiment is that agencies don't walk their talk. They say, they talk a lot about what they're trying to do, but it's not demonstrated. Whether that's in, like you say, at that hiring moment. So, you know, who is actually interviewing them, getting that sense of, you know, who is actually in the agency. Um, are there other people that have, you know, similar lived experiences going to understand my experience is really key. Um, also, you know, in terms of that piece around, like Joanne mentioned, around targets and ambition and commitment, you know, we ask when we, we advertise jobs for people to share that with us because agencies are not doing enough to show what they're trying to do differently or where, you know, where their shortfalls are and also being transparent when there are shortfalls, even if your, you know, your data shows that it's X, Y or Z and actually, you know, really interested in that kind of ethnic, you know, all minorities piece, but also from a black talent specifically piece, what is, the, what does that look like? Are you hiding the real story within, you know, what it looks like from a broader kind of minority piece? You know, all of these things are really kind of key. So I would say that, you know, from an agency perspective, agency life isn't the easiest anyway. It has We have other challenges in agency around mental health, around work life, and, you know, there's lots of other issues. And if you add that race element too, it means that it's not, a, it's not you're going to be your first choice. So, you know, you can throw as much money as you want um, at, you know, black talent in some ways in terms of just saying, okay, we're going to do X, Y, or Z, and we're going to give you a senior role. But if you're not walking your talk in terms of really offering a more inclusive approach or saying that what, what your roadmap is to getting there, black talent do see through it. And I think that there are certain companies and certain sectors that are doing a better job of showing as companies what they are doing and what that roadmap looks like. And there are certain sectors that I think black talent are gravitating to because of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from a recruitment perspective, we get asked a lot about diversity and um and I do find that you know black talent they want to go in-house and they sort of resist that resistance so it doesn't matter how much we try and convince them unless something's happening right within the agency I think it's very very hard Joanne what's your thoughts on that um stat 
Again, it doesn't really surprise me. This disappointment doesn't surprise me. The amount of stories that Black uh, talent have told me about the discrimination, racism, microaggressions that they've faced in agency life. I mean, it, it shocked me. And to be honest, you know, when I started this journey, you know, three years ago, I would have described Ketchum at that point as a really inclusive culture. I felt we were fair. You know, we always had a reputation of being really kind. So, you know, I kind of was coming from start from where I thought we were really strong. When I actually read the verbatim of our first um, Creative Equals anonymous survey, uh, some people were immediately honest, which does show we had an inclusive culture because they were confident enough to share in that um, some really horrible experiences that they'd had at Ketchum. And also on a bigger kind of um, scale, uh, what I thought was a perception that black, Asian and minority ethnic talent was moving, progressing slower in our organization than their white counterparts. But actually when I went back and looked at the data, it was true. You know, whether it was unconscious or conscious, it was true. And you kind of, I've always considered us progressive, but we needed to change some of our processes and policies and we needed to be more granular in the detail now that unconscious bias that exists day in and day out, and actually some of it's conscious, let's not pretend it's all unconscious, um, is there. And so unless you can be brave enough to look in those you know, corners of uh, your organization and accept that there are things that have been ingrained, you know, decade after decade that are going to take time to unpick, but as long as you're open and honest about it, then you've got a chance to fix it. If you deny it, then you know, you're going to be stuck like where you are kind of ongoing. Mm. Yeah. Can I just jump in on that? Actually, I, I really, really agree with that. And um, it's interesting. Um, I know, Cam, you mentioned, sorry, I've just gone blurry for one second on my camera, back. Um, Cam, you mentioned around people gravitating to other sectors and industries because they felt like it was different. I mean, we we work over a, a, a real vast range of industries and sectors in different countries. And everything I'm hearing from the data points are exactly the same in a lot of those industries, right? And that fear factor that Joanne just mentioned is, a, is real. Um, a lot of people aren't ready to dive in and deal with it as honestly and as brutally as, as, as needs to happen. And so then there, come, there becomes this veneer where, you know, let's do our... Um, our in-house reflections in-house with people from HR and let's not get someone who's going to be honest with us um, or let's 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 get someone who's going to give us that cushion and make us feel good about it at the same time that as an as a as a country uh, and kind of a, across multiple industries there is this real reticence to take that leap there has been progression and awareness of the last two years particularly when it comes to ethnic minorities following the murder of George Floyd, there's a bit more impetus on, okay, we need to do more, but actually there's still this reticence to take the proper leaps that need to happen. So this uh, like po policy review and changing into action, a lot of people just wanna take half measures, but don't realize everything that they did from a structure standpoint was to the basis minimum of law, which law never really paid attention to culture, right? It was created way before we started being more conscious and paying attention to it. So, you know, I know that we're talking about PR and there's lots of issues and areas that need to improve in recruitment, but I also see that in sadly a lot of areas and a lot of places and people go and think they're going into a place that is inclusive and it's it can be diverse, but if its attitudes aren't right, it's not inclusive and people don't hang around in any event as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to open up to the audience soon, but um, one question I'd love to sort of explore with you on, on the recruitment side is we're currently experiencing a sort of a war on talent, you know, where there's a real shortage of people out there. And my concern is when that happens, people just scramble for talent, you know, it's sort of, and the diversity issue sort of gets swept to one side. When there is a shortage of talent, um, how do businesses, when they just need someone to join, prevent themselves from just taking the first person because you know that at the moment we have never experienced uh, in my 20 years of me headhunting I've never experienced a market quite like this um where there is a lack of talent and then so what would you what advice would you give to make sure that um these diverse practices, Joanne, I mean, you're, you're saying you won't interview a shortlist until it is diverse. Are you maintaining that throughout these times? Yeah. I think you have to to be 
true to what you're trying to achieve as an organization you have to stay solid through the good and the bad times but what I would say is we are we're not struggling to get diverse shortlist because we built a reputation internally and externally as an organization that's on the right path that's making progress where you truly can come and be who you are you can show up you can see it might not be loads, but you can always see people around you who are a bit like you. And so from a senior leadership team down, and so there's a benefit to that investment. There's a benefit to staying true because, um, you know, we are seeing more diverse talent apply to Ketchum, even proactively, even without us having to headhunt than we have in our entire history. It's because we've done a lot of hard work. So if we undermine that by just, filling vacancies with bodies no matter you know who they are what their experience is then and it's not we really talk about adding to what we've got at Ketchum you know adding skills experiences backgrounds characteristics that we're either short of or we don't have at all and whilst we might have some short-term pain if the whole organization's been coming on that journey with you then that understanding goes top to bottom and people are willing to kind of lean into that. I would, I would agree also that, sorry to jump in there, but I think it's that piece around shortage of talent. What do we mean by shortage of talent? So for example, I was at um, London College of Communication, I do some lecturing and I was there yesterday and, um, and the students were saying that they are applying, applying, applying and they can't get a job. The industry says there's no, you know, there's no talent. Juniors are saying they're trying to get a job and they can't get through. And there are, and don't get me wrong, there are certain industries that they're gravitating towards fashion, beauty, entertainment, music, you know, not corporate necessarily your kind of consumer. There was a little a couple of people that wanted to go into food and drink and one surprisingly into financial services. But I think that the industry needs to do more in terms of that, you know, at a junior level making sure that pre, you know, they, that, that um, students understand all the different opportunities, but also we need to look at what we mean by talent and that point around where do people want to work? If you, you know, there is black, like we were saying that black talent exists, but they are not choosing agency. So there's not a shortage. There's a lack of people that want to work in certain places. And so, you know, for me, the two pieces go hand in hand. And obviously, Alice, you're much more closely, you know, you're closer to, you know, what, what it looks like. But I just think it's, are you doing enough to attract, truly attract talent from different backgrounds? I totally agree. And the one other thing I'd say is like the expect, like on those entry level jobs, like the amount of people who I still see, it's an entry level job and we're asking for a minimum of a year's experience. I mean, again, come on people, like, if you find people who are hungry and ambitious and smart and putting their hand up to come work in your organization they don't need a year's experience if you're a good organization you can like work with them to get them up to speed incredibly quick I mean even better than they would having kind of done intern jobs for a year I, I think we just need to change our attitude entirely yeah I agree I agree it is that definition of what really is talent if you look at some sectors there is this traditional method of well they need to have this and they need to have that and they need to have the other and that's just really coming up against this um I'm not saying some sectors aren't really struggling to hire people but I think it's I think it's because of this kind of conflict between are you really giving the right messages is your organization fit to in to engage and attract the type of talent you want but then who's looking at you and really what are you looking for and does that resonate I wonder I think a lot of uh, organizations need to really pay attention to from that whole model of future of work not necessarily talking practically well that too but it's not always about the practice of where would you work what would your hours be but also generational differences what drives your the incoming talent it's not the same as what it might have been 10 years ago people are, feel like they're far more empowered and more informed to make decisions right so where is this disconnect what's it what is this intelligence telling us and what do we need to change internally in terms of how we attract people and I, I would hope you know that 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 would happen because there's still redundancies that go on all the time there's still so many people out of out of jobs every year there is lots of different initiatives, even if you can't hire in a traditional method that you can look at bringing people in to, to still make this work um, and add value to your organization. Great. We've actually had a, a question that's quite nice timing for here, which is on utilizing um, uh, JDs and how, um, so job descriptions and 
what language should people could people use to make job descriptions more attractive to a diverse pool of of, um, of talent? Shalini, maybe you could sort of uh, give some examples there that you've seen of best practice. Yeah, sure. I think it really depends on um, one what your organisation stands for and 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 the type of role you are um, promoting or looking for. But if, if we just take it from a value base, for example, let's say you uh, you think you have an inclusive culture where everybody is free to speak up and take on more responsibility where their interests lie. Um, and 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 have this flexible working experience but then you say in your job description um client is king or queen or, or words to that effect or you allude to you know we strive to deliver over deliver for our clients and that's one of our mottos and that person automatically might read well what about me how do I get the best out of the, how does the organization get the best out of me, right? Um, let's say there is language around, um, you know, our, our culture is collaborative. We all have, we're all, we all, in, we all huddle together and engage in activities together side by side. Someone might think, well, what does that mean if I can't work in the office one day? Does that, in, does that mean I'm, I might not be involved in that? And other things can come from hours. We hold events um, every quarter um, following uh, with, with huge success and it alluding to something that refers to nighttime. What if I have childcare responsibilities? What if I just want my own evening because I spend enough time in that workplace that they don't need to get my evening, right? I've been there as well. A place gets enough of my time. I don't wanna hang around, but there's this pressure to do that. You, 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 even with the best intentions in the world about saying we do great events and we want to have fun, you're not realizing what that experience is for a person who might have other responsibilities or not want to socialize at night. We see it a lot with diversity and inclusion events. They're always held in the evening. Um, why, If they're that important, why aren't they held during lunch times or even just during working hours as, as an example? So, you know, I'm giving you some um, very high level examples there but it, it, it you know I, I would start with what is what does your organization stand for what what really are your values does the language resonate with that and scrutinize that language and think about it in an intersectional way and then start to make some changes um it we we do that review a lot for a lot for clients and find it's funny in those conversations they realize like wow I didn't expect you know, I, I thought I was saying this person needs to have gravitas, but actually they're introverted and that put them off in terms of being able to engage with, with, with that application. So there's there's just different things to think about. Right, that's really useful. Cam, I want to ask this question we've had from the audience yourself. It's about um, growing an agency. So I know you're growing your own business. Um, what advice would you give a growing consultancy to get good practice embedded early on as they grow to ensure they're a place um, which attracts people from a diverse background and want to go and work there? I think it's a lot to what some of what Joanne's talked and Charlene. It's about um, understanding your own bias. You, everyone has a an, an, uh, uh, responsibility, I guess, to understand where they are on that spectrum. You know, everybody has biases. To, to some degree, how is that impacting how, you know, the suppliers that you choose, how is that impacting the team that you're building? Um, you know, for example, we just did a project um, on Colder and for us, it was really important that we had, our supplier list was, was broad. And, you know, we worked with a black creative director and we, um, you know, we had a really mixed team. We worked with women that were older and younger. We had, um, you know, some men that were part of our um, production team. I think it's just, it's being inclusive by design, like just thinking broadly, from the outset, when you're hiring, when you're looking at CVs, you know, when you're, um, you know, procuring work or working with your partners, are we being inclusive by design and always having that stopgap? There will be times where it might be challenging. There are certain industries, you know, the film industry, for example, a bit like the PR industry, there's not a lot of diversity there, but you can, if you put the effort, look at how you, you can make sure that you're, you're doing things differently and being inclusive by design. And it's something I'm not, you know, I'm not, it's not lost on me that perhaps in some ways, because I come from a minority background, I naturally think that way. But we, I'm, you, you know, we operate in a mainstream society. But I think it's a, it's our, 
yeah, it's an imperative, really. I, I just don't understand how you can do good business without thinking, always taking those moments to think, actually, even though was, I'm time stretched, um, am I making the right decision here? Have I considered, you know, yes, my friend would be good at this or this agency that I've always worked with would be good at that. Or yes, I know such and such who I used to work with, but, you know, actually, what can I build in to make this more, more of an inclusive hiring process or a more inclusive um, response to a, a client brief? Joanne, do you want to add something on there? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think there's a piece here about, you know, one of the things that I always do is I constantly check myself. So if I am going through a recruitment process and I I will immediately, I mean, you know, we're doing some uh, mandatory, someone's asked a question about mandatory training. I have a lot of mandatory things, particularly in the DNI space. Uh, and we're doing mandatory training for you know, all 200 of us at Ketchum in the UK on neurodiversity. Uh, and one of the really interesting uh, pieces of research that is bang out the start of that training is that all of us within seven minutes of meeting someone will have made at least 11 assumptions. Like it's ingrained in our brains and it comes from our own backgrounds, our own experiences, you know, what, what's happened to us in our lives, no matter how short or long it's been so far. And so I've really learned to check myself. Why within 10 minutes of this interview have I decided this person isn't right for Ketchum? Is it because of who I am? What they, like you, you really have to have a self-reflective attitude to be able to build that inclusive culture. And the second thing is you have to hold the line. I talk about holding the line all the time. I'll give you an example. You know, about God, it's now maybe kind of three and a half years ago now. I was recruiting for um, a creative director. We all know the stats on creative directors in this country. And um, the first 40, 40 CVs that came in uh, to me were all white men, all of them. Now, I've got, not, I've got a lot of like, white men who work for me and they're very, very talented. But there was just a question I was asking the partners I was working with, like, you're telling me there's no women, there's no people of colour. Like, you're, you're basically telling me that this is completely void. And I, you know, it took six months for me to get to a point where I agreed to interview uh, and actually, my final shortlist of three were three women, two of whom were black, one of whom was gay. And they were, I mean, I would have hired all of them on the spot. They were incredible talent. And we just had to work hard to find it. There was also some really, really talented white men in there as well. But it's one of those things where you're, you have to keep holding the line. You have to hold yourself. I think what Cam said is right. Hold yourself accountable for the decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis and make sure you're checking that you're doing it for the right reasons. Right, thank you. Just to quickly jump in there and not to sound morbid at all, I think one of the reasons why people don't hold the line or hold themselves accountable and constantly check their own behavior, because I do think that's important, is, is probably twofold. One, it's, it's not innate in them to do that. They've never really needed to. There could be a whole privilege dynamic to that. We don't know. It could just be the, the makeup of who you are. So it's one, changing that behavior, and that takes time for some people. And two, others, it's also... I'm under pressure. I have a day job. I have targets. I have deadlines. I can barely, you know, I'm expected to do a lot more with, with less. I'm struggling here. I don't have time to go the distance to make sure that we get this right in the right way. And to those people, which I, I sense just based on the work we've done, probably the majority, I completely understand why they would feel that way and and all of that adds that whole intersectional dynamic about how it makes you feel your own well-being the works but ultimately it's going to have a knock-on impact to your business it's going to have a knock-on impact to the people who stay with you and it's and all that's going to do if you don't get on board is actually fingers start fingers start pointing and people start looking at you as a potential blocker for that and that's not meant to be a threat or, or, or something for people to, to, to worry and become anxious about. It's just, it's just the way I think this, this, this change is coming across multiple industries is more, you need to really get on board and, and get on board with the journey or you will get left behind and employers need to prepare, need to ensure that their structures and their environments hold that space for people to do that too. Because if you are putting undue or, an, or a hell of a lot of pressure on your staff, but you expect them to deliver that, then something's wrong there with the environment to, to be able to make it happen. And then it's just a perpetuating cycle where nothing really changes other than people get more stressed and, and, and there's less diversity. Absolutely, thank you. Um, 
we've had quite a few questions around um, uh, creating more inclusive environments. So the retention piece, um, you know, engaging in more meaningful conversations to ensure retention. One individual has said, we hire and promote purely based on merit. Do we need to do anything else to make sure we're inclusive? So maybe some sort of top tips on inclusivity and ensuring that businesses have those meaningful conversations. Charlene, maybe you give some... No, I was going to say that even, you know, I understand you, you promote on merit, right? But <laughs> who, you has, there. <laughs> you know, who has which clients? So one of the things that we found with our survey, for example, black talent don't always get the opportunity to work on the star clients, the big clients that are, you know, that get the most exposure, that the, that the agency really cares about, that you know, gives them a wide breadth of different things to do. They don't always have the best line managers, therefore. So they might be working on, you know, not, not saying best always correlates to the size of the team, but, you know, really important business. You know, we, we, know, we know how agencies um, work in terms of how they might select those teams. If black talent is not even getting a, a foot in the door of working on some of the accounts that are the gateway to having more experience, to growing their careers, um, to building themselves professionally, almost the merit bit is is kind of void because that's what we're finding is that you know we've spoken quite a lot about recruitment and appointments rightfully so but the talent if you if you have got any black talent in your organization where are they in your business are they you know if, are they sitting in the middle is there someone you're overlooking it comes back to that point that Charlene made around equity you know what would actually be fair in terms of giving them opportunities to really have the gateway to be in more senior positions and to be promoted on merit, you know? And I just think that these are the things that we need to interrogate at all points, you know, shortage of talent, what are we really saying here? Merit, what are we really saying here? 360 reviews, you know, I've got spoken to members who have been through a whole 360 process, been told to do a lot of things, have delivered over and over again, but still stuck in the same role for four or five years. So, you know, I just would really encourage agency leaders and leadership teams to really look at what they mean and what they're saying um, when they're saying that that's the only way that their talent um, is promoted within an agency or organization. Yeah, on the on the merit front, the question we you know we we only only promote on merit. My 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 point would be, do you really? And are you absolutely sure? And that's not meant to be disrespectful. It's an honest question. Do you really know that, right? Because here's the thing: for you to establish merit means that you have to have KPIs. You have to have you have to have measurements for you to define what your merit is. Where did those measurements come from? How are they designed? Is there bias that's encroached in that merit merit categorization? But also, who makes decisions? How inclusive and collaborative is the group that make the decision about what merit scores go to which people? And then how does that then funnel through into your promotion process? And how is that fair? So, you know, I have not come across one process yet in my long career of, of doing this work where there isn't bias to weed out. Right. So I would I would say, you know, look at what you actually define as merit, because I can almost guarantee you you um, there'll be issues. And that's not to say that that's a it is a problem and it needs to be changed, but that's not to be like, that's a terrible employer. It's a lot that a lot of organizations are dealing with right now. And just to add to that, I think the other dynamic that we've been noticing again, anecdotally from members is because of, almost because of BLM and everything that's happened and agencies trying to do more, there's a nervousness around giving feedback. And there's a nervousness around, you know, what actually, what constitutes as your HR process can deal with that, if you know, in terms of, you know performance what are you trying to do to really enable your talent to grow and to progress and if you know feedback is re a really important part of that so you know if you're worried that you're going to be offending because you're giving feedback there is an issue there in your processes um that is actually then preventing black talent from from moving forward so i just think that you know it's it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach you've really got to like you know charlene's been talking to really got to interrogate what is going on, understand what is going on in your, in your company, and then look at what are the solutions to, to address it. Yeah, so I'm sorry, Alice. I just want to tag team again on what Cam was saying. <laughs> we should talk after Cam. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, to that point of, that's a real, really, really valid point. People are, 
people are terrified around saying the wrong thing and giving feedback and being accused of being racist as an example and I've heard multiple times that either because of COVID or the racial unrest around the world, people felt like they shouldn't or couldn't give feedback, right? Mm -hmm. There's a question around whether that feedback is fair, right? Or whether there's bias in, ingrained in that. That that we're, we're not talking about that right now, but there's a significant lacking of confidence to be able to be effective as leaders right now. And I made that point earlier around DNI equity is not a technical skill set of a lot of leaders managing people is not a technical skill set of a lot of leaders that they're, they're hired to do a technical job and then all of a sudden they've got to manage and then all of a sudden DNA is around and you, you should know this right and this there's this apprehension doesn't excuse that things need to change and people need that time to develop it but it does recognize actually where that apprehension is coming from and I see it not only is it a fundamental issue to your culture and how you recruit diverse talent but it's actually a legal risk you need to somehow get over that through the right support with your organization and I think that where that's where it comes into mandatory training don't give people an option as Joanne was saying I completely agree with that but that training needs to be practical and action oriented we run simulations for people so they can role play out how on earth they tackle a difficult situation start doing that with your leaders so that they can build that confidence and so if and when those situations arise they're more equipped and the process can actually work. There's so many tensions pulling at it right now that it's all becoming ineffective because not everything is kind of symbiotic. Thank you for that. Um, Joanne, we've had a specific question I know you wanted to answer <laughs> and we lost you momentarily. So um, please, you managed to get back. Yeah, sorry, I'm back on my phone. Yeah, I wanted to answer Robert's question about our global um, executive team. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the kind of observation and criticism of us being a predominantly white uh, global exec team is right. What I would say about Mike Doyle, you know, he was appointed in July 2020, uh, and he's one of the very few openly gay global CEOs, and I think that should be you know, applauded. Uh, and actually his first two appointments to his executive team, one was myself, which I was obviously thrilled by. I'm a working class girl from Glasgow. So, you know, from a social economic point of view, adding diversity, but actually the second was Neera Chowdhury. Uh, who joined us from uh, Goal and is now our North America president. So again, I think you know, whilst we have a lot to do, I think his first two appointments were absolutely thinking about the diversity of his senior team. And I'm sure you now he's uh, just over a year into the job now, I'm sure we'll continue to see that as his senior team evolves. Great, thank you for that, Joe. Um, we've had a lot of actually questions about, again, still on, on um, uh, on attraction um, and actually trying to get people from different backgrounds into the industry who aren't thinking about PR and comms as, a, as an industry to, to get into from diverse backgrounds. Um, uh, Robert commenting that actually, you know, agencies need to do more to go out and go to campuses and do online Zoom sessions um, to encourage students and individuals from all different backgrounds um, to come into the industry. Um, I don't know what thoughts are on, on that um, and how we can start maybe learning from other industries that are getting people from more diverse backgrounds to come in. So what can agencies do more? Are they doing stuff? Should they be doing more? Joanna, I'm sure Ketchum's doing quite a lot in terms of, of getting people from diverse backgrounds. Yeah, look, I mean, you look at our industry as a whole and it's dominated by you know, white middle class people. And a lot of the time it's through, you know, we, we've got one of the highest number of people from private education uh, of any industry. I mean, it's quite mind blowing how our industry's evolved over the last you know, 20, 30 years. So you know, I think Robert's spot on. One of the, we do many things. One of the things that's been really good for us uh, is a partnership we do with an organization called Future Frontiers. Uh, they work with um, kind of inner city schools in London from deprived areas. Um, most of the kids are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, and every year they come and train about 30 of our people and how how to be mentors and coaches uh, to people uh, of a you know, young age about to choose their GCSEs. Uh, and then we get allocated a whole class uh, from one of these schools. And we spend uh, about six weeks where they come into uh, the office 
get to see a PR agency. Uh, and it's not there to sell PR per se, although that's obviously a subtle undertone as they engage with PR professionals see a uh, London PR agency in operation. But it's to help them make good choices as they go into their GCSE ER, where they share their ambitions. They might not have anyone in their family who's had uh, a professional job, an office-based job. They might want to be a doctor, but have no one in their family or network where they understand the sorts of choices you need to make at this early stage. And that has been a phenomenal programme because for Ket, I mean, we've got great feedback from the students, but from a Ketchum point of view, it's opened our minds. You know, those 30 people that get trained each year get to see the absolute value in reaching out to people who don't come from what is a traditional background into PR, the skills, the expertise, the experience that people can bring, even if they haven't gone to university. You know, actually, there's huge benefit in that uh, many, many times. So that's one of the things that we do. But certainly as an industry, it's something we need to do more of. Great, thank you for that, Joanne. Um, I'm conscious of time, and there's one very important question I think um, needs to be addressed. So, Charlene, this is probably aimed more at you from a legal background, but what advice would you give to an ethnic minority professionals who are facing the mildest of discrimination, which they find hard to prove? How do you how do they continue to progress without upsetting the boat too much, and and the risk of being seen as a troublemaker? Um, Charlene, have you got some advice there? Yeah, it's, that's it's a, it's a really, really hard. Um, and I think it would apply to anyone as well in terms of another form of diversity if they felt that they were being ostracized or not included. I think the most important thing to say is um, you should not be working or feel that you have to work in a place where you suffer in silence. Um, it might feel like that's the only place you should be, but actually your talent the only I use this analogy and it, it clicked for me when I started to move on in my career the only fluid thing in your career is you we if you think of a conveyor belt all the different cogs I used to think of my employer as the conveyor belt and me being one of the cogs and actually it's reverse I'm the conveyor belt and all the cogs are the places I choose to work right so flip that and think about the only one fluid thing in your career and and how you design it is completely down to you so you should not be working in an environment where you're subjected to that type of experience, however slight. The second thing I would say is slight, repeated, becomes bigger issues and over a period of time can have a massive knock-on effect. And by law, that can easily amount to bullying, harassment. You know, there a lot of, there's a lot of um, kind of connections being drawing now from traditional law around bullying and harassment where it comes to microaggressions. Um, just because somebody doesn't see the microaggression as being the same doesn't mean it's actually it's not occurring and it's not an issue and a breach of policy. I would say the most important thing for you to do in the first step of anything is you have to voice your concerns. You should voice them to HR, you should or your manager, you should speak up and you should say why. If you're really worried about that, you know, think about maybe anonymously making that complaint. Um, I will say there is only so much employers can do with anonymous complaints because if you know, if I'm investigating an issue where somebody has been on the receiving end of microaggressions, I can't go to the person you're accusing and, and really get underneath what's happened here without saying this is what has happened, right? So there's a balance that there. But ultimately, you know, you, you should just don't, if, if it doesn't change and you flag it, then you should, you should just move on because it will not be worth your time staying there. Toxic cultures like that will never change. Um, and it's not your responsibility to change it either. And you're, you're a talented individual and just go elsewhere. Or if there's an issue around the timing of when you can leave, let's say you feel trapped from a pay or responsibilities perspective, build a plan and then start to navigate out of that. But in terms of taking remedial action, you should be flagging it to your HR or your manager. or you should, and, and if they don't, um, think about escalating it. But I do recognize that, that challenge there. It's, um, it, 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 there's no way of removing it, right? There's a nervousness there of what, if I'm about to say this, what's going to happen? And one thing that I would add from an employer perspective, like those of us who are hiring people this was pointed out to me by one of our other partners BME PR pros about three years ago where we often judge people's CVs like how often have they moved oh god if they've moved every like 
you know, one to two years, then they're clearly like they don't stick at things. And um, in one of the training sessions we did with them, you know, there was a number of anonymous case studies where people had just experienced continuous racial discrimination. And rather than cause the fuss, as many people do uh they basically chose to move on and so it looked like they were flaky but actually they were just removing themselves from toxic situations so don't judge cvs uh based on how long people have spent there because they might have made decisions to move they probably have made decisions to move for the right reasons rather than what we've always assumed traditionally it's for a wrong reason very good the only point last there. thing i'd add i know we're conscious of time is that that's that it, it's not uncommon so the, the stat i didn't mention was 55 percent of people um, in our survey said that they ignore racism in order to progress. So there are a lot of people in agency, you know, like you say, there, there, there is that moment that comes when people leave, um, but there are a lot of people in that situation. And I completely agree with everything that Charlene says. I think, you know, that is half the reason why we created the Black Comms Network, because, yeah, once you, as a collective, when you hear these things, we offer different services to support people um, around kind of mediation, but around just that sharing of experience and how different people have dealt with different things. Sometimes it, you know, in, in addition to going through those traditional processes, having a little bit of a community who understands what you're going through and how different people have navigated it, as well as providing some resources is like what we're here to do. So I think, you know, there's networks like ours, but I think there are lots of other networks as well um, that potentially can support in that area too. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much indeed for sharing all your advice and tips today and insights. Um, you know, it, it's been a great discussion. We've had lots of questions and they keep keep firing through as well. Um, so what we are going to do is make this into a, a valuable piece of content that we can share to businesses to really fundamentally make change. Um, you know, Charlene, your experience at Howlett Brown, absolutely invaluable. Cam, your experience of running your own agency, Calder, and obviously um, with the Black Communications Network and Joanne from Ketchum. Um, it's fantastic to get all that together and share that. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you to the audience for, for joining today and all your fantastic questions and um, lovely comments about the panel and, and what you've done today. So um, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.